Okay, um, I'd like to start off uh, the seminar by thanking Professor Zam for inviting me here to give this seminar. Um, again, my name is uh, Warren Chan. I am an associate professor at the University of Toronto in, in Canada. And my home institute is called the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. Um, it's actually a department at the University of Toronto. So it was an experiment that was uh, built uh, 10 years ago by the uh, university in which our institute is actually part of three faculty. So we're part of uh, faculty of engineering, faculty of medicine, and faculty of dentistry. So the purpose of this institute was to try to inspire uh, interdisciplinary research. So the, the faculty makes up three major themes. One is in nanomedicine and imaging. Second theme is in regenerative medicine, uh, tissue uh, regeneration, uh, stem cell research. And the third theme of the institute is in rehabilitation engineering. So, and the point of this institute is to try to create new ideas from people from various backgrounds. So, and it's worked uh, extremely well since I started. I think I was the uh, second or third hire, and we've hired about 20 to 25 new faculty since the, uh, the start. So, it's a grown department. And I'm also affiliated with the Biomolecular Research Center, Material Science Department, Chemistry and Chemical Engineering. So I interact with uh, people from various departments. And the university is also uh, within walking distances to seven or eight different hospitals. So all of us uh, have a lot of interactions and work uh, with a lot of uh, different clinicians in terms of trying to translate some of these technologies we're developing. So today I'm going to give a, a perspective in terms of uh, nanomedicine, uh, the past, the current present, and what's the future aspect of nanomedical uh, research that's happening in the world at this point. But before I start, I'd like to um, start off by defining what nanotechnology is. So there are essentially four or five different types of definitions out there depending whether you're looking at the Japanese definition, the British definition, the American definition, or the European definition. But I think in general, most of these definitions share some commonality. So one of the commonalities is that this field involves materials in at least one dimension. It could be X, Y, Z, or some combinations of these different, uh, different um, axes in the size range of 1 to 100 nanometer. So that's the one of the first definition. The second aspect that's commonality between um, all, the, all the different definitions from the different countries is that it refers to intentional design. So you're actually purposely designing materials, particles, structures, or objects that are essentially in the size range of 1 to 100 nanometers. And I'll explain, as my uh, previous speaker uh, mentioned, that the size range, the properties of materials are very unique. That's different than the atomic state or the bulk state. And again, the major principles of nanotechnology really stems from the fact that you can tune the physical properties of a material. And we saw this in the previous lecture in terms of the optical and the magnetic properties of the materials he's mentioned. But the other aspect that's emerging now is that you can also tune the biological properties of materials. So you can change how a structure, a drug, a contrast agent is essentially moving in the body by changing the size of the carrier or changing how these particular molecules, like an antibody, interact with a cell, again, by changing the size of the carrier that's delivering that molecule into the cellular target. And I'll spend a little bit more details in terms of each of these parameters in the next few slides. So the first uh, principle I would like to discuss in, in, in greater details is the physical properties of the materials. So this usually involves three uh, specific properties. One is the optical properties of material, so the color of a material, the heat that can be produced from a material, or the fluorescence emission that's usually observed when a material's uh, electrons is excited from a ground state to an excited state and returns back to a ground state. The second aspect of the physical properties of a material that changes in the nano size range is the electrical properties of a material. So the flow of electrons from one point to the next. So that also gets changed by, by using nano. The third aspect, of we, as we've heard, is the magnetic properties of the material. So all these three per, uh, specific properties are related to the size and the shape and the surface chemistry of the nano object that you're working with. So before we talk about the, the, the visual observations of these properties, I'd like to start off by discussing the principles of the electron. So all these tunable properties associated with material 
are all related to how electrons are behaving in an, a nanostructure and how the electrons are forced to behave in a certain manner in these particular nanostructures. So most of us know that electrons essentially surrounds the neutron and protons of an atom. So this is an atom. You have the neutron and protons here. And the electrons are essentially moving within a space that's outside of the, uh, the, the, the nucleus of an atom. And what an electron can do is that they can move between energy states. So if you take an atom, you add some energy into that atom, it will cause the electrons to go from, for example, in this state to a state that's far beyond this particular point. After a certain period of time, that electron can come back down to the initial state. Okay? So, so that's one property of an electron, is that it can move between the energy states of an atom. The second property of an electron is that they can spin in different directions. So electrons, if you think about it, can spin in this way, and it can spin in this way. So when it's spinning, it creates an electric field surrounding the, uh, the, the, the atom. And I'll explain why that's important for MRI imaging. So as a result of changes in the energy state, or the how an electron is moving from one level to the next, or how an electron is spinning, you can change the color, the fluorescence, and the magnetic properties of the particular material. So the way I look at nano is by using this diagram. So imagine if you have a structure with different number of atoms. So you have one that have one atom, one that had three atoms joined together, one that has six, one that has 22, and one that has 26. And let's look at the properties in terms of the color of these particular materials. So when you have very few atoms, let's say one atom, the, 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 the color of your solution of that particular atom is usually clear. Or if it's certain like copper or nickel, you might have a green color or, or a blue color. So depending on how the electrons is moving from one direction to the next. So when you increase the atom from one to three, what you see is that you see a minute difference in the color of your solution, but not a huge difference. If you have a large, lots of atoms, in this case, let's say 22 and 26, what you do is you see, for, let's say, for example, a red color, if you change from 22 to 26 atoms, the solution basically stays red. If you go up to 100 atoms, it still stays red. And a good example is gold. So most of us know gold is yellowish color, right? So if you change your, your jewelry, if you make more gold atoms, the color does not change. However, if you look at gold, in the nano size range, it actually looks, uh, it looks red, so the solution is red and not yellowish color. And if your gold particles by themselves, they're red, but if your gold particles that are aggregated, meaning multiple gold particles are assembled together, it goes to blue. So, so the fact is that the bulk state, again, if you look at gold, the bulk state is yellow, the atomic state of gold is usually clear. But in some range in between, in this case, I've defined it as six atoms and 19 atoms, the color of your solution now is directly related to the number of atoms you have. So if you have six atoms, the solution might appear as a blue color. If you have 12 atoms, you have green color. And if you have 19, you have a red color solution. So essentially in the nano state, the properties of the material is related directly to the number of atoms that make up that structure. So this is called the nano state, which is different than the atomic state and the bulk state. And this is what I mean by the, uh, by the term tunability. So it allows you to tune the properties of a material by simply changing the size in this particular case. And so as, I, as the previous speaker mentioned, in terms of quantum dots, as, uh, as what he showed as an example, with quantum dots, what you see is a direct correlation between the fluorescence emission of the particle and the size of the particle. And again, uh, he mentioned it's a quantum, uh, quantum uh, size effect. So what ends up happening is that when you have an electron, again, at one level, you have some energy to that particular structure, that electron goes from now a ground state to an excited state. So this energy difference is the delta E, and that delta E corresponds to the color, the fluorescence color of the quantum dot. As you start increasing the size of the quantum dot, what you see is that this delta E starts decreasing from large to small. So now, of course, because of the, the color of the uh, delta E, you see the difference in color of the solution. So a large delta E corresponds to a blue color. A small delta E corresponds to a red color. And what you see now is that you can actually now make solutions 
that corresponds to the energy difference, right? So in this example here, you can see that the, the, small, uh, the smaller particles emit a green color, which is shown here, and then the previous speaker showed some blue color quantum dots, and you can see the, the larger particle, which has a smaller delta E, produce red color emission. And if you start making these particles bigger, let's say 6 nanometers, 12 nanometers, 15 nanometers, above 12 to 15 nanometers, the color of the solution, the emission stays red, right? So when we define the nano state as 100 nanometers, what that means is that not every material has this tunable property uh, at below 100 nanometers. So the composition of the material dictates where the nano state starts and ends. So with these particular quantum dots, this is usually about 9 nanometers. So above 9 nanometers, the fluorescence are always red. It doesn't change beyond red. But if we change this material, let's say, to lead selenide. So these are cadmium selenide quantum dots. But if you change the lead selenide, the number now increases to 20 nanometers. So the composition dictates where the state, the tunability state of a material is. Once it goes above that state, the color doesn't change, the fluorescence doesn't change, and the magnetic properties do not change. But 100 nanometer is a safe number to indicate most, nano, most materials that are below 100 nanometers will have that tunable property, right? In some cases, there are a few examples where it's above 100, but in most cases, it's 100 and below. So another example here is the magnetic strength of a, of a, a nanoparticle. So this is, again, shows the tunability aspect. So when you have an electron, it spins in the same state. Here, it spins in one state. And again, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the spin of the electrons. So when the particles are below 20 nanometers, and in this particular case, it's iron oxide nanoparticles, what you see is that all the electrons spin exactly the same state because they spin in exactly the same state. All the magnetic fields that surround each electron starts adding up. So the total magnetic field of surrounding this particular particle is representative by the, the total magnetic fields of all the electrons. So because they are all spin in the same state, all the magnetic fields are aligned with one another, so your magnetic field becomes huge because it's a, it's a summation of all the electrons. If the particle becomes bigger, what ends up happening is that you have electrons that spin in one state, which is shown here. You have electrons that spin in the opposite direction. So you have a magnetic field that goes in this direction. Then you have another one that goes in the opposite direction. So the total magnetic field essentially starts canceling one, in, one another. So when they cancel one another, you essentially the, the, the field strength surrounding the particle becomes less. So again, when they're all aligned, it's a huge magnetic field. When they're larger particles, the magnetic field starts canceling one another, so the magnetic field becomes smaller. So this actually has a major effect in terms of using nanoparticles for, for magnetic resonance imaging. So here's an example of how a stronger magnetic field leads to a higher contrast in MRI imaging. So the top part here, what I show is how, uh, how uh, MRI uh, imaging occurs. It usually involves a precession of a proton. So a proton is in, is in water, so a lot of times in a, a tumor, it tends to be more hydrated than in a non-tumor system. So the proton essentially can, can start in this direction, so it spins in this state. When you add energy to it, it processes down this way, and then when it comes back down to the original state, it emits energy. So when you have a region with a lot of protons versus regions that do not have a lot of protons, you'll see a contrast because the water molecule, each time it does this, it essentially produces an energy, and that energy is compared to the normal state, which has slower or less amount of uh, protons that are spinning. So what ends up happening is that when you have a region with a huge magnetic field, so for example, if you take these particles and you target a tumor, you have a large magnetic field surrounding these uh, uh, water molecules or, or protons, what ends up happening is that the, the proton starts going faster. The more times it produces a signal, the higher contrast at that particular region. So the higher the strength, the, the higher the, the more the, uh, the proton essentially processes back and forth, and the greater the, the contrast you get in terms of your, your MRI imaging. So again, so those are two examples of tunable properties of a material. So I just showed tunable optical properties, tunable magnetic properties. 
But the other、uh, area that has really emerged in the last five years or so has been demonstrating or or observing how the tunable biological properties of a material. So as I mentioned before, the transport of a particle into cells, tissues, and organs are strongly dependent on the size, shape, and chemistry of the material. How the particles interact with the receptors on cells are also dependent on these particular properties of the nanostructure. And how the interaction of the particles with proteins, DNA, and other biological molecules are also related to the size, shape, and surface chemistry of the material. So,、uh, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, the size of most nanomaterials are between the range of a water molecule upwards to the size of a virus or size of a bacteria. So, it's within this range that's similar in size, shape, and conditions to most DNA structures. Proteins, for example, an antibody is approximately 15 nanometers. So a lot of nanoparticles are about 15 nanometers. So because of the small size of these particles, they can actually be transported into the body, into different、uh, body parts, different organs, without restriction. So what I show here is an example of a, a tumor system in which, as a tumor starts growing, it has vessels that are very leaky. So what that means is that the vessels, as it starts growing, It starts producing little holes in the vessel, so it's not a nice uniform structure. And what ends up happening is that these holes can range in size between 100 nanometers to 500 nanometers, depending on the tumor type that you have or the tumor stage that you have. So if you're trying to deliver a drug into a tumor and you use a carrier that's let's say 600 nanometers, it's never going to be able to diffuse out of the vessel and into the tumor system. So you can't treat your cells. Because you cannot deliver your drugs into the the, the 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 tumor system, most of the chemotherapeutic agents it allows it to penetrate through the vessels. But what ends up happening is that a lot of times with these chemotherapeutic agents, the kinetics is so fast it goes into the tumor, the extracellular matrix, and it comes out very quickly. So it's hard to control how long the chemotherapeutic agent stays within the、uh, the tumor system. However, within this size range, one to one hundred nanometers is a great range by which you can be transported out of the vessels into the extracellular matrix of the tumor, and also by controlling the size of the particle, you can control how long these particular uh, carrier, uh, the chemotherapeutic agents, stay within the tumor system. But the fact is that the size is small enough; it allows it to access the tumor system at this particular point. The second aspect I just want to show here, again, how size affects how it's transporting into the body. So we did these experiments in my lab, where we basically took a gold particle that's 15 nanometers, another one that's 105 nanometers. Again, the 15 nanometers is labeled with a blue color. The 105 nanometers is labeled with a red color. Injected both of these particles into the animal, and the tumor is located in this region. Injected into the tail of the animal. And then what we saw, we image how these particles are moving within the body of the animal. And what we can see is that the distribution kinetics of these different sized particles are very different, right? So you can see here, there's more blue signal here, less red,、uh, more red here. And as time goes on, you see the signal starts differentiating. You can also see here, for example, in the tumor that you both have red and blue signal, and through enough time, you mostly see a blue signal at this particular region. So. Again, the size of the particle dictates how long they're being transported into the animal. So one of the things that we're trying to、uh, do in my lab is to understand how the size, shape, and chemistry affects how it's moving through the bloodstream, affects how long the particle stays in the tumor, and how that that size of the particle affects the therapeutic efficiency of a drug that we place on the particles themselves. Here's another example of how size of a particle. Controls the therapeutic efficiency. So in this example, we obtained Herceptin, which is a breast cancer drug from Genentech. We took Herceptin and placed it on three different size nanoparticles. So a small one, something in between, a large particle, and we measure the cell death due to the different size particles. And what we observed is that when you have a 40 to 50 nanometer particle, it kills the cells more efficiently than when it's on a smaller particle. Than the Herceptin by itself, or with a large particle. So what we're seeing here is that the Her Herceptin therapeutic efficiency using a cell culture model is more effective at killing than the, the drug itself or something that's very large. 
And what we observe in further measurements is that the size of the particle affects how the Herceptin and the receptor ERBB2 are interacting with each other. So in this example, when using a small particle, neither the Herceptin with the ERBB2 receptor complex gets internalized. So essentially the particle stays on the surface of the cell. If you use a larger particle, same, same principle. But for some interesting reason, the mid-intermediate sized particles essentially get internalized by the cell. So again, in this example here, we're using the size of a particle to dictate how the Herceptin is interacting with the receptor complex. So again, one of the, the crucial aspects of nanoparticles is that they have a multivalent avid avidity to the receptor target. So in this case here, when it has multiple interactions, this is a very strong bond, this is a very weaker bond, and this is somewhere in between. Again, it affects how it gets internalized, how it gets cy cycled through the cell. And what we also show here in this Western blotting experiment is that the size of the particle also affects what proteins are being produced by the cell. So in this case, we'll look at MAP kinase. The 40 and 50 down regulates this particular expression of this receptor more efficiently than a larger and smaller particle. But what this example shows is that the particle size influences how the cell is responding to the drug. In the previous example, we show how the transport of the, the, the particles or the drugs is dependent on the size of the particle. So, so these are, are some of the main properties in terms of biological effects. But the other properties of announced structures that makes them very useful for biological or medical applications is that now particles can also be designed to have a large surface area to volume ratio. They can be designed to be porous, so there's holes inside, or they can be hollow inside. So what this means is that this allows you to load a large amount of contrast with therapeutic agents for delivery of tumors. So instead of injecting, let's say, chemotherapeutic agent where you're hoping to inject enough to kill the tumor more effectively than healthy cells, what you're doing here is that you're essentially loading the drug inside these vesicles and you're allowing the, the large amount of delivery into the tumor because they have to, you can load hundreds and thousands of these particular drugs inside these uh, carriers. The other aspects that you're also protecting the drug from being degraded or broken down by the biological system. So it allows you to improve efficiency in terms of delivery. Um, so again, from protects drugs and contrast agents from, from degradation. 